Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, Hurricane Track here. It is now July 4th. Happy Independence Day to you. 2024. Hate to spoil the party, but we got to talk about Hurricane Barrel. I'll try to be as quick as I can with this today, but there are some important aspects to it. Obviously, Barrel has ravaged parts of the Caribbean, and I don't think that is hyperbolic to say at all. We saw what happened in the Windward Islands, Jamaica yesterday, the Cayman Islands last night into early this morning. And next up, we got to focus on what's going to be happening in the Yucatan, across the Yucatan, and then eventually that all-important end game. Where does Barrel end up? How strong will it be when it gets there? All that stuff. I'll try to at least guide you in the direction of what to look for yourselves after you're done watching my face today. All right? All right. Good to have you with me. Let's see what we've got. We'll start with, hey, look at this, off of our interactive tracking map in the eastern Pacific. What is that? The first tropical depression of the season might not make it to name storm intensity when the East Pacific is down, and we'll do a little down arrow uh, for that. The Atlantic Basin is usually up, and barrel down here is proof positive of exactly that. No issues with first TD in the Pacific, so we'll just scroll in here, zoom in, and take a look at barrel. Good news is, I guess you could say, down to Category 2, after being an historic Category 5 and all that, you guys have already seen plenty of that information. So what do we have now? Well, the 2 p.m. Intermediate Advisory shows, yes, the winds are down to 110, the pressure 974. Barrel has been undergoing some different uh, battles. It's been enduring stronger upper-level winds that have been cutting through, maybe some dry air interaction with some of these mountainous areas like the island of Jamaica. And now that it's over the Northwest Caribbean, it does have a window of opportunity from where it is now until landfall over here later tonight into tomorrow, uh, where it could intensify some more. We'll have to wait and see about that. I'll show you some interesting trends on satellite imagery in just a moment. Across the Yucatan it goes, and honestly, this trek right through here is very important for what may or may not happen over here. A more northerly track, I think you can understand it could be more north. A more southerly track, it could be more south. That's pretty much common sense. Let's try to figure out sort of the who, what, when, where, and why behind all that. Real quick, though, I want to show you this dashboard because I do think it's very, very important to make sure that my viewers are aware that this information is here from the National Hurricane Center. So I'm going to kind of point to it with both those arrows for you. You got your wind speed probabilities, arrival time of winds, the wind history, interactive maps, all kinds of stuff, the key messages, rainfall potential, really good information there. And then I want to add, too, there's a lot of stuff in the public advisory that's very helpful. The forecast advisory is great for marine interest and the computer programs that scrape the data for automatic tracking charts and stuff like what we have, as well as other apps and whatnot. But then the forecast discussion is very, very helpful. That gives you insight into what the forecaster, and in some cases forecasters, plural, are thinking. You, you literally get into their head because this is written not by AI. Boy, if that ever happens, I quit. <laughs> Seriously. So this is real. This is from a real person. In this case, it's Dr. Jack Bevan. I've known Jack since the late 90s. And uh, just good information. I want to point that out to you. It's all there, right at your fingertips, all right? So here's the bigger picture. There's our weak, small tropical depression in the eastern Pacific. And ladies and gentlemen, the fact that this is basically shut down is another huge sign for what's going to be happening over here in the coming days, weeks, and months. We've already seen it with Barrel. Not trying to continue to promote any kind of doom and gloom or anything like that, but we've got to face the facts Look at what happened with Barrel in July, late June into July, and we know the conditions are going to be favorable going forward from here on out. We're going to have these down periods, certainly, but when it ticks up again, things are just going to ramp right back up, and we're going to have to be ever vigilant anywhere from the Caribbean through the Central American region, the Greater Antilles, the United States, Canada, and even all the way across the big pond to the UK, from whom which we declared our independence this day in 1776. Just had to throw that in there, didn't you, Mark? Just saying, you got to watch these things, even across over in Europe. Seriously, because they curve around that big Bermuda Azores high, and we can have a lot of problems with the leftovers of these systems. Atlantic, Canada, you name it. All of what we're seeing is a sign of things to come. It really is. So let's see what we have, though, in the present. We're, we will worry about the future 
when it gets here. First of all, look at that eye trying to pop out there again uh, after passing the Cayman Islands and vicinity, and there's the western side of Jamaica. Saw some pretty remarkable video from Robert Ray from Fox Weather, as well as other people in Jamaica from yesterday. Now Beryl is free and clear of any land for a while, and it's not quite as symmetrical as we saw recently, but that eye popping out there, and then you can just see on the visible satellite imagery the way this energy is just getting kind of thrown out here in the upper levels. So the outflow is a little bit more established right now. It's not perfect, but we're not seeing a whole bunch of clouds get sheared off in this direction. It's not getting decoupled. And uh, it might not be perfectly aligned where the eye, and I'll just draw it for you, where you basically have a cylinder, you know, and it's kind of like that. I'm trying to draw 3D for you here. We don't necessarily have that, but it certainly isn't like this. You understand where everything's tilted and sheared apart, and it's taking advantage of some pretty warm water temperatures there as it makes its way toward the Yucatan. So for those of you with interest there, you're already there now. You know people there. Yes, you're probably going to have hurricane conditions tomorrow, and you need to be ready for that. Onshore flow, heavy rain, storm surge, big waves. There will be damage. There will be power outages. Cruise ships that are in these areas that have itineraries will be impacted, as I mentioned the other day. A little bit of a self-promotion again, but yes, we do a bunch of stuff other than these updates. We have a series called Hurricane U. It's an educational series, and the most recent one that I produce is with Craig Setzer, one of two meteorologists for Royal Caribbean. I recommend you take a look at that. It just gives you some good insight on how the cruise industry handles big storms such as Beryl. So we know it's headed for the Yucatan. We know there will be impacts there. What about after the Yucatan? Let's move into that part of today's update. So we could look at all the different models, but that takes a long time. We want to get back to celebrating our independence, right? So looking at the spaghetti plots, as they are so affectionately called, um, we get the idea that the first part here is fairly straightforward. Uh, not much divergence in the modeling. It gets a little bit more spread out, but still pretty uniform here between days three and four, something like that. But in the longer term, between days three and five, there's a lot more spread, including in some of the ensemble means up here and so forth. But the general idea is, from most of the reliable guidance, the Euro, the GFS, the Canadian, the different hurricane-specific models from the HMON, the HWARF, the new HAFS models, all this kind of stuff. I mean, there's so many now. It's like, what? The ensemble means, the TVCN, those are our consensus models. All of that gives us a fairly balanced idea that a trek across the Yucatan and then either northern Mexico or south central Texas to extreme south Texas for direct impacts. Direct. That's the, if this, when you look at this, if I had live closed captioning, i got to readjust here because I'm getting fired up. you got to understand direct, like I'm feeling the wind, I'm feeling the surge, that kind of thing, versus indirect impacts, which can have terrible consequences. Those would be the swells that are going to be generated, the big waves that are going to emanate across the Gulf here. I'm just drawing this in just as an example. You're going to feel that from Florida all the way across to Mexico, all along the Gulf Coast and even parts of the Atlantic coast. So please, 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 you're at the beach, you're getting ready to go to the beach, you know people at the beach, have them visit weather.gov, weather.gov, and just see if there's a rip current statement. Pay attention to those flags. If you have red flags, you know, the purples mean something's living out there that could bite you or sting you or whatever, but the red, fl the red flags at the, uh, the lifeguard stations are there for a reason. Ask the lifeguard, what's that all about? What's that red flag for? I need you alive to watch these videos. All right, we'll look at it from, hey, Mark's very selfish. He wants me to stay alive. Of course I do. That's the bottom line here. So this is a, uh, not a consensus, even though the consensus is in there. But this is the models, all right, in a nutshell. People want to know, well, what are the models showing? Well, there you go. Well, let's look at a specific model, the venerable, and uh, it eventually will be, will be retired once we get more data from the new HAFS models, but the good old H wharf still hanging in there, hurricane weather research forecast model. This is the latest run. It's a hurricane specific model. It's not a global model. It has a background state from the global models. I think it's the GFS, 
But all that technical stuff aside, what does it show? Well, it handles the current initialization pretty well. 971, we know Recon showed 974. So it's a hair stronger in the pressure field anyway than what Recon showed. But a good initialization. Hey, there's 974. That's spot on. And that's valid pretty much right now when I'm doing this update. So there you go. I think the h -Wharf has a good initialization. So what we're looking at here is basically what it would look like on radar, right? And uh, the pressure in the middle there, the eye. So let's just move this through. And we see it does try to deepen or strengthen just a little bit before landfall there along the northeast part of the Yucatan. All those rain bands coming in, you can see that. Across the Yucatan it goes popping out on the northwest coast, more disorganized, certainly might ingest some dry air, all that stuff. And then it begins that important trek towards either Mexico or Texas or both. And watch what happens, though. It certainly gets disorganized here. Pressure goes up to 995, and then it starts to drop again as the organization starts to get better. A better environment. Water temperatures over there are very warm. I'll show you that as we conclude in just a moment. And then you can start to see Mexico come into frame there. And I'll point it out in case you're like, where? Right there. That's the coast of Mexico. And there's our eye getting better defined in the H wharf model as it closes in. And it starts to strengthen again from that 995 dropping down to 972, 971. A closed eye, eye wall, that kind of thing. And then we get really close here to South Texas in the very early morning hours of Monday. So you got Boca Chica down there, SpaceX, and you have this hurricane that's now down to 958 millibars right there. A well-defined eye and eye wall, a compact CDO, central dense overcast. In the model taken verbatim, this would be a nasty hit for our friends in Matamoros, in that area in Mexico, the Rio Grande Valley, the lower valley there, South Padre Island, been there many times, Boca Chica, all the SpaceX people down there. Yeah, this would be a big deal. But notice it's also kind of going slower, getting slower there as it approaches the coast, finally making landfall somewhere at the Mexico-Texas border, U.S. border there, coming inland, but just kind of creeping along. And this taken just at face value, that's a lot, let's use blue here, that's a lot of onshore flow coming into a huge part of the Texas coastline here. Houston's way up here in case you're wondering. But areas like Corpus Christi south, yeah, you could get some serious onshore flow. That curved shape of the coastline here funnels the water in there, captures it very well. So my point here for Texans, and certainly for our friends in Mexico, I don't want to leave you out, but your coast bumps out there, so the surge isn't as big of an issue. But the Texas coastline is going to catch that onshore flow. We will see probably substantial water rises because of this, regardless of where the center comes in. And obviously the more intense it is, the closer to you know Brownsville or South Padre this goes, the more those impacts will be exacerbated. And this is out at 111 hours. This is now into very early morning hours of Tuesday. So a potential huge rainmaker, coastal storm surge, maybe hurricane conditions, maybe cat two or three. We just don't know. The reality is the forecast intensity is where the least amount of skill lies in hurricane forecasting. And I want to make that point again. Track is pretty darn good. Intensity forecasting, not so much. So we're going to have to watch this very closely. And for our friends down there in Texas, northern Mexico, you know, a landfall 50 miles farther south than this won't matter too much. You're still going to get that onshore flow. There will be direct and substantial indirect impacts from barrel as it comes in wherever it does so. One thing working in its favor, warmer than normal sea surface temperatures through this area, especially right at the coast there, not churned up and mixed up from all that activity that we've had through this area, which has knocked those anomalies down to closer to normal. But right against the coast here, you do have this one little area where water temperatures are about 2 degrees Celsius warmer, so almost 2 to 3 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. And while that doesn't seem like much, it is a lot of extra energy, so that's something to keep in mind as well. A couple things here, then I'll let you go. Very interesting tweet here from Eric Webb. 
We cite Eric a lot. The long-term potential for making landfall on the U.S. or Texas coast, you know, that, you know, one and the same, in the next several days is very dependent on the intensity, but also of potential downshear, tugging, or reformation of the center. There's just a lot that's going on here, and I wanted to show you this. The latest info, this is about an hour and some change old now, you can clearly see the eye of barrel right there. And what is all this stuff? That is all of the other guidance, well, most of it. And clearly, barrel is north of the majority of the guidance from earlier. Just saying. So all of that's going to start to matter, because the more time this spins over water after the Yucatan, the more chance it has to reorganize. So we have to watch that very closely as we go forward. All right, so I want to tell you about this once more. I'll probably do it maybe Monday as well, because we're almost out of these. We do have a paper version of a tracking map, the long-lost art of tracking on a piece of paper. There's me to show you a sense of scale. If you want one, you can go to the link there, hurricanetrack.com slash track map. I'll put it in the description of today's video. It's big. It's a nice big poster size, full-color tracking map. And for those of you that ordered one, I want to tell you again from right there. I really appreciate it. And I'm not making truckloads of money from this. That's not the point. It is artwork. I made that map myself long time ago. That's the first thing I ever did as a hurricane entrepreneur is I made these big tracking maps way back in 1996. And they were even bigger back then. They were like 28 by 40 inches. They were huge because I wanted them to be like movie posters to get people's attention to learn about hurricanes, to track them by hand. I mean, we didn't have apps in 96, had computer programs. But if you want a long lost art and an art form from yours truly, I made that in Adobe Illustrator. Part of my degree program as a geographer, you can get one. 20 bucks plus $3 for me to mail it to you, and you own an original piece of artwork. There you go. And it makes a good gift. And look, I know we've already had a few name storms, but you can go back and catch up and put those in. And you can teach your kids. You can use these in a classroom or homeschool setting and learn about geography, lat long, all that kind of stuff. And keep track of this obvious historic hurricane season. Again, I'll put the link to that in today's video. All right? Tried to keep it short, but this is important. I appreciate you tuning in. All of us at Hurricane Track have a great community supported through Patreon. We're on Twitter and YouTube the most, so thank you for tuning in and following along on those two platforms. I think that's just about it. Please be safe out there. I want you back with all your fingers, eyes, and ears intact. Otherwise, what's the point, right? From the bottom of my heart, I do want you to be safe. I love having you. I am Mark Sadath. I'll talk to you again tomorrow morning.